Hello board game brothers and sisters, I'm Adam Singer and welcome to another episode where I'll be letting you know of all the board games launching on Kickstarter and GameFound over the next week. If you're new to the channel, we do this every week going over all the upcoming campaigns, so if you want to stay up to date, this is definitely the place to be. But before we get started, I do like to go over some news and announcements that I just found out about over the past week, and I only really have a couple things to mention, but maybe we can take a look at my spreadsheet first, because we are getting near the end of the year here, and things do start to slow down, and we still do have a pretty busy week for this week, but it looks like we are going to be starting to slow down right at the beginning of December here. I do have a bunch of games that I was expecting in 2023, but I think it's pretty safe to say that those are probably going to be pushed off to sometime next year. But like I said, I do have a new announcement, and that's that there is a announcement for the game Conan from Monolith, and it's been a while since we heard anything about this one. This is a game that already has a ton of content, and then they did also release another game that follows the same system, which was Batman Gotham City Chronicles, which also has a ton of content out for it as well. But just a word of caution, both of these games have a large rule overhead, and both of them did have a lot of complaints with the rule books when they were originally released. I think both of them did end up having their rule books rewritten. I'm not sure on the reception of those and if they did a better job with their second attempt, but I do know a lot of people love this game. This is going to be adding a brand new expansion as well as a versus mode. So if you're interested to learn more about the game or what this new expansion adds, I will go into it in more detail during the week of its launch, which is going to be for January 16th. So if you're not subscribed already, make sure to subscribe down below and tune in early in the next year and I will have you covered. Other than that, I do just want to give a quick reminder that I will be attending the Level Up event here in February, and this is going to be hosted in Woodbridge, New Jersey. This is also hosted by Alex over at Board Game Co. So if you want to meet and hang out with Alex, as well as all of his content creator friends, including myself, a lot of us are going to be there. And there's going to be a lot of other cool people from the community as well, including designers and just people that love board games and are just a ton of fun to be with because I have already attended this once. It was definitely the most fun and the most board games that I've ever played at any sort of board game event, so I really do recommend it. And I'd love to see you there, and if you are attending, feel free to reach out to me or find me there, and I'd be happy to play a game. But that is not the only event that I plan to attend, and if you are in Canada, specifically in Ontario, there is a smaller event that's going to be hosted just north of Toronto. This is just a tiny event, but I will be going along with Jenna from board game garden so if you're in canada and you want to hang out definitely feel free to check that out and i'll have it linked in the description below as well and we are getting near the end of the month here and i don't know what it is about november but this month just flew by for me which i'm not completely upset with because november is probably my least favorite month of the year i'm sorry if any of you were born in November or have anything special about this month, but November in Canada is kind of like that transitional period where you don't have any of those nice fall colors anymore and everything's just really, really gray and it's just starting to get cold, but it's not quite there yet. So you can't do your warm weather events and then you can't really do your winter events because you don't have snow. And then also in Canada, we don't have any holidays in November, which is maybe one of the reasons that I felt like I had no time at all. So enough about November and let's get to December. And if you do want to hear about the games to come in the month of December, I mean, you pretty much saw them all in that spreadsheet there, but Alex does post a video at the start of each month going over the games launching for that month. It's not going to be a whole lot for December, but there still is some exciting games there. And if you want to check that out, he will be posting that very soon. You can find a link to his channel in the description below. But Alex also provides all sorts of other content, posting videos, even multiple videos every single day. He does an excellent job along with a few of his friends, and he just covers all sorts of Kickstarter and GameFound content, which if you are interested in, you'll probably want to check out as well. But if you want even more content specifically to do with historical war games, this is a little bit different than your typical board game because it is more of like a historical simulation. So I don't tend to dive into these quite as much, but I still do track them. So instead of me spending as much time on those as I do with the other games, I still track them, but then I just pass them off to Mike over at Zillow Blitz because he also tracks all of this stuff himself and he has way more sources for this than I do. And he posts a video every single month as well going over those historical board games. So if that is a genre you're interested in, he does a fantastic job. He also has a ton of other videos as well that you'll definitely want to check out. And I'll have a link to his channel in the description as well. But that's it for an intro. And like I said, we still do have a full week ahead of us with about 10 games to cover. So let's check them out.
And the first campaign we have launches on November 28th, and this one's called Boundless Stride into the Denlands. And this plays one to four players, it takes about 45 to 60 minutes to play. And this one is a cooperative legacy game where players are going to be trying to complete different missions, primarily through pick up and deliver, as they move through a story and discover different secrets about the world, and modify the terrain of the board, the different locations, and even the characters through the decisions that they make and the different secrets that they uncover along the way, even introducing some new rules and mechanisms that will change the game every time you play. But the way this game works is players are going to be drawing four different character cards at the start of the game and there's a bunch of different characters included in the game with each of them having some different stats for their movement and carrying capacity as well as their own unique abilities. But since there's so many different options within the game but you're only going to be using four, this means that you can have a very different combination from game to game even if you did play a similar scenario over again. But you're going to be taking each of these cards as well as the associated tokens and then putting those tokens out in the four corners of the board. The main board is also going to have a few different locations that can also be modified with different stickers as you play throughout the Legacy campaign. But there's also going to be some different locations that can generate resources as well as these hidden encounter tokens. The different colors on the board also represent different types of terrain and this is going to be important when it comes to movement but can also have some other effects as well. In order to win the game players are going to be trying to complete different mission cards that are revealed at the start of the game but then players are going to be playing over a series of rounds performing actions in order to try and fulfill those cards. Each round consists of a day phase and a night phase and during the day phase players are going to be moving those four characters around the board gathering different resources and then delivering those resources to different locations to complete missions as well as get different benefits but they'll also be fighting back different threats which i will come back to in a second here and then they'll also be able to visit various encounter tokens but what is really interesting about the movement in this game is that you don't really have a fixed movement in the form of hexes or spaces. Instead, players are going to be using these movement tokens in order to move across the board. It's a really neat mechanism that allows you to kind of freeform your movement in order to connect to different locations and points of interest that you might want to visit. But each of these tokens does also come with various colors on them, and you need to match those colors with the terrain that you're moving over in order to be be able to use that token and you can see that here and yes the white token is a wild which gives you a little bit more flexibility but like I said there's a bunch of different points of interest that you can visit and some of these will have positive and negative effects while others might have a page number and whenever you see that you're going to be taking the encounter booklet going to that page and resolving whatever effects and story that that has to reveal. But after players have performed all their actions, then we're going to be moving into the night phase. And this is where a bunch of new things can happen out on the board because you're going to be drawing different night tokens that can have all sorts of different effects. They can add more resources or points of interest to the board, but they can also add those threats and hazards that I mentioned earlier. There's different types of hazards that can be added to the board and they're going to be going into designated locations and if they ever overfill that location then that is one of the ways that you can lose the game. There's also some different enemies that can get spawned out on the board as well and if you get too many of them out it can also cost you the game but they're also going to be blocking areas of the board because if an enemy ever comes into contact with one of your heroes then that's going to be losing you the game so this means that you're going to have to take care with your movement and try to avoid locations where you think they might spawn. Of course, like I said, this is a legacy game, so you're going to be leveling up and discovering new mechanisms and ways to maneuver out on the board, so I'm sure you will discover new ways to deal with all of these threats, and also I'm sure they'll find more creative ways to get in your way. But the game continues like this, with players trying to complete those different mission cards in order to move the story forward and discover more of what it has to offer as they play through the overarching campaign. As always, if you are interested in this one, I will have the links in the description below, and of course you can click to get notified. Also launching on November 28th, we have 1793 Patriots and Traders, and this plays 1-5 to five players and takes about 30-120 to 120 minutes to play. And this one is a historical war-themed game, so definitely check out Zilla Blitz if you want to learn more on this one, but I'll give you a quick overview of how it plays. And this one, even though it is a historical war game, it's not like a lot of war games that might come to mind because you're not going to be controlling your different units or putting chits out on a board. Instead, this is a game that's played almost entirely with cards and this is actually a cooperative game. In this game, players are playing as revolutionaries in France during the fall of the monarchy back in the 1700s. Players are going to be using those multi-use action cards to gain influence in the different locations out on the board to gain special 
benefits as well as access to those location specific abilities. Players will also be able to take advantage of their leader card's special abilities in order to help them along the way and to incite that revolution. And if they are able to do that without getting assassinated or getting imprisoned along the way, then they do win the game. And if you are interested to check this one out, I'll have it linked in the description below. Also on November 28th, we have 123 Cheese, and this plays 2 to 5 players and takes about 10 to 20 minutes to play. And this is a game all about a heist gone wrong. Players are caught red handed with a whole bunch of different cheeses, and players are trying to escape with the least amount of cheese in their possession because whoever has the least amount of points at the end of this game is the one that wins the game. The way this game plays is that each player is going to be dealt a hand of six cards at the start of the game, and then each player is going to be choosing one of their cards to put face up in front of them, starting their very own stash. And like I said, you want to have the least amount of points in this game, so you want to keep your stash as small as possible because each card in your stash is going to be worth one point. But even worse, any cards left in your hand at the end of the round are going to be worth two points. And the end of the round is triggered as soon as one person's able to get rid of all their cards, so you want to be the first person to do that. But there is one more thing to be aware of because there's going to be one special card that's going to be worth a lot more than all the others if you happen to get stuck with it at the end of the round. And the way that this is determined is that you're just going to be drawing one card randomly from the main deck and then revealing it to all players. And whichever type of cheese that is, it's going to be worth the amount of points as depicted on that card. Once all that's done, players are just going to be taking turns performing one action on their turn in order to play cards from their hand to one of the stashes out in front of them. You can play to any of your opponent's stash, but you can also play to your own as well. But like I said, you want to have the least points in this game, which means keeping your stash as small as possible but also trying to get rid of all your cards first so you really want to be strategic with how you play cards where because there are certain rules to where cards can be placed you can play a card from your hand matching the color of any of the stashes as long as your card is of higher value or instead you can break that rule by playing two cards of the same color on top of any stash also matching that color disregarding any of the values but you can also play a run of cards on top of any other color even if it doesn't match but if you can't do any of those the last option is to draw a card from the top of the deck. Some cards do also have some special effects and there is also a wild that can be any color or any number giving you a little bit more flexibility if you are lucky enough to get that card. But a big reason for wanting to play cards into your own stash is because after the first round you're going to be taking all the cards from your stash and then you're going to be repeating the same process. So if you do have certain cards in your stash and you're able to create runs of cards in order to get them out of your hand really quickly in the second round, that might be something to be taken advantage of. The game does also have a few other modes of play so if this one does sound interesting to you definitely check it out and I will have links to the campaign in the description below. Also launching on the 28th, we have the next campaign being launched by IV Games. And this one's actually going to be a double feature with a brand new game as well as an expansion for their previous game, Moonrakers. And if you aren't familiar with Moonrakers, this is a fantastic game that features deck building as well as a bit of push your luck and a really unique card action mechanism where each of your cards has a very specific action and there's actually a card you need to play in order to play more cards so just because you might have the cards you need in your hand if you're not able to play them they're not really going to be of much help the cool thing about this is that some of these cards allow you to draw more cards from your draw deck essentially allowing you to push your luck hoping that you'll get the cards that you need in order to play more cards. Like I said, this is a deck building game, so you do have some control over the makeup of your deck. And there are also some special crew cards that you can get that are quite powerful and add a little bit more flexibility as you move throughout the game. But the fun doesn't stop there because negotiation is actually a huge part of this game as well and I will come back to how this whole game plays in just a second here because I did already cover this game in the past and I'll just go ahead and roll that previous footage after I explain what's going on with this campaign. But before I get too far ahead of myself, I should probably mention that this one is also my own personal pick of the week. And there's a few reasons for that because I think there is a lot to love with this campaign and I think Moon Rollers looks like a ton of fun. 
But the primary reason that I'm making this one my pick is because I just absolutely love Moonrakers. This is a fantastic game and it's already been released so there is very little risk here. And something that is really neat about this campaign is that even though Moon Rollers is a completely separate game, it does have cards and components that are compatible as a mini expansion with the game Moonrakers. So even though they're completely two separate games and you can't just mix them together, there is a part of Moon Rollers that can be mixed with Moonrakers. And that just gives you more options and if maybe you don't like Moon Rollers as much as you hoped, you might still want to keep it just as a little expansion. But I'll come back to Moon Rollers in just a second here and start just by explaining what the Dark Matter expansion is. But I'll come back to Moon Rollers in a second here because I think I can explain what the Dark Matter expansion for Moonrakers is pretty quickly here because this is a 35 card expansion that introduces Dark Matter into the game. Dark Matter is going to be a brand new card that you can add into your deck and it can pair with other cards in your deck or even parts of your ship to create powerful upgrades. The cool thing about this is that Dark Matter is completely useless on its own. I really love this because it just offers a new way for you to push your luck because you can add these to your deck and have potentially very powerful upgrades from them but you don't want to be adding too many of these because that's just going to increase the likelihood that you're drawing too many of these dark matter cards and you're not able to pair them with anything. Another cool feature with the Dark Matter is that you don't acquire them in the same way as the other cards by buying them through the market. Instead, each of your ship parts are going to have a unique way to generate Dark Matter and you're going to be using that instead. Moon Rollers is kind of a dice rolling version of Moonrakers, but I say all of this very loosely because the games are very different from each other and Moon Rollers can play in about 20 minutes and it is naturally a much lighter version of the game. But the way this game works is that players are going to be trying to complete different mission cards just like in Moonrakers, but then rather than playing those cards, you're going to be rolling dice. Each of these cards will have different requirements that need to be fulfilled by rolling those specific dice that number of times, with some of these requirements also being associated with hazards. And it's pretty cool how the hazards work in this game because rather than rolling hazard dice like how you do in Moonrakers, instead you're going to be drawing a hazard token blindly. Each of these tokens can have a certain amount of hazards associated associated with it, as well as a certain amount of victory points. But you only get these victory points at the end of the game, and you are allowed to keep these tokens secret for the entirety of the game. The catch here is that if you're the player with the most hazards at the end of the game, then all your victory points that you would have got for the hazard tokens are instead forfeit and you don't get any victory points from your hazard tokens. Luckily, you still can get victory points by completing these different mission cards, which is the primary way to get victory points in this game. Players will be taking turns rolling a pool of dice with each side of the die representing a different icon that you can find on one of the cards. You'll be spending these dice in order to fulfill those requirements of those cards, but once you start fulfilling a single card on your turn, you can only work towards fulfilling that one. There is also a certain icon you can roll that doesn't fulfill any requirements on the cards, but it does allow you to gain more dice if you decide to roll again. Because in this game, you are allowed to keep rolling your dice as many times as you want, potentially getting more with each roll. But the catch here is that once you start fulfilling a card, if you ever roll your dice and you don't have anything that you can contribute to that card, then you bust and all the progress you made on that card then is removed. But if a player decides to stop before busting, then they do gain victory points proportional to the contribution that they made to that card, even if they didn't fully complete it. But if they do complete a card, then they'll also be able to take that card into their possession, which will grant them a special ability for the rest of the game. And it is also one of the end game triggers, because once a player has a certain amount of cards in their possession, that's going to be triggering the end of the game. And once that happens, players all reveal their hazard tokens, revealing which player has the most, and then that player won't earn victory points from them. But then the rest of the players will add any of the victory points they earn from their hazards onto the victory points that they have on the victory point track, then the player the most wins the game. And if you are interested in this one, or if you're interested in Moonrakers, which I highly recommend, you can find a link to the campaign in the description below. And if you're not familiar with Moonrakers, I did say I would roll my previous footage, so I'll go ahead and do that now. 
And in this game, players are playing as mercenaries and you're trying to complete contracts in order to gain victory points. But the contracts that you might go up against might be too difficult for a single player to achieve. So you might want to enlist the help of the other players. And this is where the negotiation comes into play because the players will negotiate who will contribute what and how the rewards will be split amongst them. But each player in this game is going to be starting with an identical deck of 10 cards and their own personal player board. And the game plays over a series of rounds where players will be taking turns essentially choosing one of two possible actions. And the two actions are to stay at your base or to attempt to fulfill a contract. And I'll just go over the easier one first and that's to stay at your base and if you choose to do that you'll just gain a coin, gain a secret objective which you can try to complete before the end of the game and earn victory points. And optionally you can discard and replace one contract that is currently out on the table. But if you're able to, you're probably going to want to try and complete a contract because that's what's going to allow you to win the game. And when you go to complete a contract, you can just choose any of the contracts out on the table. And each contract is going to require a certain number of icons of certain types, as well as possibly requiring the players to roll hazard dice in order to complete that contract. So this contract down in the bottom left would require four green cards with the shield and four blue cards with the lightning bolt. And it would also require the players to roll three hazard dice. And players want to try and avoid rolling hazard dice because if you roll a hazard it means that you could potentially lose one point for each hazard rolled. But there's a way to defend against that and I'll get back to that shortly. And once you've chosen your contract and decided if you wanted to try and complete it yourself or try to negotiate some help from the other players, you'll then try to complete that contract by playing cards from your hand in order to fulfill the requirements of that card. But a neat aspect of the card play here is that you're not only playing cards from your hand to try and fulfill those requirements, but each card actually has an ability associated with it. So every time you play a card, that ability is going to get triggered. So it does matter the order that you play the cards and you might want to chain them in a particular way. And the different cards could do different things like allowing you to play more cards on your turn, draw more cards from your draw deck, or even defend against those hazards. So like I mentioned before, if you roll a hazard, it could potentially lose you a point, but if you're able to play a shield on your turn, then it will defend against one of those hazards. So if you rolled three hazards, you'll want to try and play three shields, whether or not the contract required it. And whether or not the contract was a success or a failure, you'll then be able to buy new cards at the end of your turn. And there's a couple cards that you can buy. You can either buy new crew members, which will get added to your deck. And these are special cards that have a special ability when you go to play them, but they can also be a requirement for some of the contracts because the crew cards do also have a special icon and color associated with them. Or instead you could buy ship parts, which you can go ahead and add to your board. And that will give you a permanent ability that you'll have for the rest of the game. And this is a game that's been getting a lot of praise from the board game community, so it's no surprise that this one is our Discord pick of the week. But after looking into this one a little bit more, I think all this gameplay looks like a lot of fun. I really like the way that the card play works and how you get an ability with each card that you play, but then also you're gonna be chaining them in such a way that's gonna have a really neat puzzle as you're trying to fulfill the requirements of the contract and then also trying to mitigate those hazards. But also getting special abilities and crew members does sound really fun to me as well. So this one is also my personal pick of the week. And this campaign will allow you to get all the previous content, but it's also going to be releasing a big box solution to store all the expansions that are also being added to the game. And there's going to be four different types of expansions. The first one is Binding Ties, and this is essentially going to incentivize players to work together so that you get even more rewards when you do that. So this is going to add a lot more cooperative play to your play sessions if you like to have more of that in your game. Then there's the Overload expansion, which is just going to add a whole bunch of content to your game. So there's going to be more objectives, more ship parts, more crew members, but there's also going to be some new types of contracts that will have some new requirements that were never seen before. And it'll even have some advanced action cards that will allow you to do more faster. There's also the Nomad expansion, which adds a completely new board where players will be able to explore different areas of the galaxy. And there's going to be a lot more contracts out with the contracts being associated with different areas on the board. So depending on the type of ship parts you get and the crew members, some contracts in certain areas might be easier for you than others. This is going to allow you to seek those out by going to those specific areas in order to get those specific types of contracts. This one also introduces global effects that will affect all players. 
And then finally, there is the Luminor expansion. And this one is really interesting and one of the reasons that I made this one my pick of the week because this is actually a digital addition to the game and it's not required to play the game by any means, but it's gonna allow players to play the game either completely solo or completely cooperative against the game. The software is gonna act as the world and the enemies that players are gonna interact with and there will be a little bit of a narrative campaign that it will walk the players through. And there's also some big bosses that players will have to go up against at different parts in the story. But the reason that I think this is so cool is because this is gonna be offered completely for free. So if you already own the game or if you just wanna get the core game, you'll also be able to get this solo cooperative campaign mode. And that's really cool because it's just rewarding all the people that already back the game and anyone who decides to buy it in the future because you're gonna be getting a whole new way to play the game completely free, just adding more great content to a game that already looks amazing. Also launching on November 28th, we have Good Knack. And this plays two players, and takes about 15 to 45 minutes to play. And this one is an experience expandable card combat game where players are going to be going up against each other in a head-to-head -head competition of trying to defend their stronghold while defeating their opponents. And the way this game works is that there's going to be a bunch of different factions to choose from and players are going to be building up a 20 card deck from a chosen faction. Most of these cards will be a fighter card which has a certain strength as well as a certain type with each type having sort of a rock paper scissors mechanism with one being strong against another. But in addition to these fighter cards, there's also going to be five hero cards that each player has, which work very similar to the fighters, but have a special ability. And then there's also going to be five tactics cards, and these are special cards that players can use for different effects. But after players have each built up their deck of 20 cards, you're going to be putting it on your side of the board on top of your stronghold. And these cards are important to protect your stronghold because if an enemy card ever gets adjacent to your stronghold at the start of your turn, then you lose the game. But until then, players are going to be taking turns drawing a card from that deck at the start of their turn and then performing two actions. The different actions available are to draw another card from your deck, deploy a card from your hand out onto the board, and you can stack cards out on the board of the same type, allowing you to move them a little bit more efficiently because that is another action you can perform. And then of course there is the attack action. You can attack any cards adjacent to you and you're just going to be comparing your strength and the player with the highest strength wins that combat, removing the other one from the board. This also means that if your strength is the same, then you both get eliminated from the board. But don't forget that each of the fighters does have a type associated with them and certain types are stronger against others. So that does give you an additional strength to your fighter if you do have that advantage. Final action you can perform is the defend action, and this is only something that you might want to do when there is an attacker right at the front gates of your stronghold, which just means that it's in an adjacent space. Whenever that happens, you can perform the defend action to discard as many cards from your deck equal to that opponent's strength in order to instantly defeat them. This is generally a good thing because every time you start your turn with an enemy adjacent to your stronghold, you're going to have to discard one of the cards on top of your deck which will cause you to go through your cards a lot faster. And if that enemy is still there, once your stronghold is revealed at the start of one of your turns, then you instantly lose the game. But of course, performing that defend action also does cause you to go through your deck a little bit faster. So you do have to weigh the pros and cons of that. And if you think you might have a fighter that can take them out without you doing that. And the game continues like this until one of the player's strongholds is defeated and then the other player wins the game. And this game looks like a lot of fun. I think it's going to be offering you a lot of depth to complexity because it looks like there's a lot of strategy here without a whole lot of rules overhead, which is always something I'm a big fan of. And if that sounds interesting to you, you can check it out. I'll have links to the campaign in the description below. Also launching on the 28th, we have Mind Your Own Plate, and this plays two to four players and takes about 20 to 45 minutes to play. And I couldn't find a whole lot of info on the details on the gameplay on this one, but I do have enough to give you a high level, so I'll let you know what I do know. And this is a game where players are essentially working together to complete a meal. But this isn't a co-op game, because in this game, each player is gonna have their own objective of different calories and food that they want involved in this meal. And although you might be able to take advantage of the other player decisions to try and complete your goals, you're essentially going to be rolling with the punches in order to try and do that. The overall meal is going to be made up of four different plates as well as a beverage with each of those contributing to the calories, the quality, and the price. And then at the end of the game, players are going to be earning victory points depending on how close that is to their objective. The player with the most victory points at the end of the game wins the game. 
Launching on December 1st, we have Time War Stellar Assault, and this is a game for two players. It takes about 30 to 60 minutes to play. And unfortunately, I don't have too many pictures of this one, but this is essentially a game where players are going to be deploying their units out on a board and then using cards to move around the board and engage in combat. Players are going to have secret missions at the start of the game in order to try and take possession over certain planets. In order to win the game, players will have to take possession of their planets, but they also need to take possession of the central planet as well, which means that no matter what, you're always going to be competing against your opponent for that. Cards are a central aspect to this game and the way that you get more cards into your hand is by trying to control more planets. The way that combat works in this game is that each player is going to be taking turns placing one card face down in front of them until both players pass. This can continue for some time which means that you might also do this not with the intention to win the battle but instead to try and get your opponent to waste all their good cards because if you happen to have a lot of not so great cards in your hand you might just initiate that combat as a bluff to try and waste your opponent's cards. But the game continues like this until one of those players is able to meet their objective and then that player wins the game and if you're interested in this one I'll have it linked in the description below. Also launching on December 1st, we have Fire Noodles Eating Champs, and this is a game for two players. It takes just five to ten minutes to play, and this is a real-time dice rolling game. So the way that this game works is that each player is going to be rolling a pool of dice in order to try and match the icons on their various cards. Players are racing to be the first to complete their cards, and you can roll and re-roll your dice as many times as you want in order to fulfill all the different icons on the card, with these hotter cards being more difficult to complete. But the catch here is that any time that you roll one of these spicy faces, you're not able to re-roll that die unless you re-roll all your dice essentially starting over. That's pretty much all there is to it and the game continues like this until one of the players completes all their cards and then that player wins the game. And if you are interested in this one, you can check it out. I'll have it linked down below. Also launching on December 1st, we have Draconicus and this plays 2 to 6 players and takes about 180 to 300 minutes to play. And in this game, players are each playing as different adventurers, each with their own special ability. But you're going to be managing your health and your provisions, along with your magic and a few other stats, in order to complete your quest, which is going to be made up of a few different objectives. You're going to have to find quest-specific artifacts, and then also raise your influence with specific factions, with each of those factions having different specialties and interests. And then you'll have to complete your main quest action, and then return to your home village. Players are going to be accomplishing this over a series of rounds, with each round representing an entire year, broken into the four phases which each represent an individual season. The round starts in spring, where players are going to be planning out their actions, taking turns putting their action tokens out on this action tracker in order to reserve it for the following phase. The interesting thing here is that there is a particular sequence to how these actions resolve, so depending on where you put your token is going to determine when you get to perform that action. But there's a bunch of different actions with many of them being related to resource generation or resource conversion because you can perform an action just to earn gold or instead you could perform an action to convert that gold into provisions which are essentially used as action points in order to help you move around the board. But you can also perform a action to restore your health but then there's also another action to spend health in order to generate magic. The thing I really like about all this resource generation and resource conversion is that there's also an action to upgrade any of these in order to help you either generate more of a resource or convert more of a resource for one action. Players can also perform actions to pay provisions or health to move around on the board, gain additional quest cards, or gain influence at their location. Of course there is also an action to engage in combat, and combat is resolved with dice rolling. But after all the players have performed their actions, you're going to be moving into the fall phase where players are allowed to trade amongst each other and offer different items up for bid. The winter phase is where the round cleanup happens where you're going to be preparing the board for the following round. And then you're also going to be drawing an event card that can have all sorts of effects on the state of the game or introduce some new rules or restrictions that the players will have to deal with. The rounds continue like this as players build up their resource generation engine in order to try and complete their quest first, and the first player to do that wins the game, and if you are interested in this one, you can find more in the description below. Also launch on December 1st, we have BB Blast, and this plays 2-4 to four players and takes about 5-15 to 15 minutes to play, and this is a competitive game where players are going to be playing on teams against each other in an airsoft tournament. 
In this game, each player is going to be choosing their class of either light, medium, or heavy, and the class that you choose is going to come with specific stats that indicate how many lives you have, your speed, as well as your actions. It's also going to come with a special ability as well as a number of points that you'll be able to spend in order to equip your character with some starting gear. It is required that all players must have a gun, and each gun is going to have different stats associated with it that indicate its accuracy. The neat thing about accuracy is that when you shoot your gun you're gonna have to roll a die below a certain value but your accuracy is just the starting value and then it's going to be reducing depending on how many spaces the opponent player is away but in addition to a gun there's all sorts of other weapons like a tripwire a rubber throwing knife a grenade and even a riot shield and these all have some different effects and abilities for players to take advantage of players are going to be taking turns performing the number of actions available to them based on their class and you'll be able to use those actions to move around on the board use your items and fire your weapon when a player is eliminated, they do spawn back on the board up to the number of lives that they have according to their class, but the first player to eliminate the opponent team enough times so that they can no longer respawn wins the game, and if you want to check this one out, I will have it linked in the description below. And that's everything I have for you this week, but don't leave yet because we still got a few awesome giveaways to announce, and these are the easiest giveaways to enter ever. All you gotta do is leave a comment down below, and the first giveaway we have here is offered by Gameland Games, and they are running a campaign right now for Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. And this is a game that's been around for a while, and a ton of people love it. I haven't had the opportunity to try this one, but it's always been a game I wanted to try. Something that I do really love about this game is that it is a 4x game, but it doesn't take that long to play. Once you understand the game, you can knock out a game in about two and a half hours and it's also a game that has multiple paths to victory and multiple ways to upgrade your units and a cool thing about this game is that even when it's not your turn you still do have opportunities to perform actions because depending on the actions that your opponents choose you can actually spend one of your units to also perform that action but I really do love what I'm seeing with this campaign and although there is a ton of content and it does cost you upwards of $300 for all that content the price on everything here is actually quite reasonable. I don't think I can actually find these games at a better price. It's even competitive with my local game store, and the more that you purchase in the campaign, the more of a deal you'll get. And I know a lot of you would be really excited to win this game, but Gameland Games wasn't able to offer a giveaway for one of these pledges this time around, but they still did want to offer something up for a giveaway. So instead, they're going to be offering up two tiny epic games to whoever wins this giveaway. And there's so many tiny epic games to choose from these days with them covering so many different genres and styles and mechanisms. And to enter this giveaway, just leave a comment down below with the hashtag epic and you can say anything that you want. But if you're looking for something in particular, maybe you could let us know one or two tiny epic games that you would choose if you win this giveaway. I know for myself, I would pick tiny epic Vikings because that one just looked like an amazing game. And then I'd also go with Tiny Epic Galaxies because I've just heard so many positive reviews on it. And almost every single one of my gaming buddies has played this game and told me how good it is and I still haven't had the opportunity. Good luck in the giveaway, but of course that's not all we have for today. We also have a pledge giveaway for the game Wasabi, a game of raw skill. And this is the next game being offered by Kids Table Board Games. And in this game, players are going to be taking turns placing tiles out onto a sushi board in order to create certain groups to complete different order cards. Cool thing about this is that every time you complete an order, you're going to be adding a wasabi to the wasabi dish. But if you're not able to complete an order card, then you'll be able to take all of those wasabi for yourself with each of those being worth a victory point. There's also some different action cards that you can take advantage of for some special abilities along the way and once the board is completely full that's going to be triggering the end of the game where players are going to be adding up their points from their completed order cards as well as any wasabi that they manage to take into their possession. As always with kids table board games the artwork and graphic design on this looks fantastic and for one of last week's giveaways I actually asked you to let us know what your favorite seafood is and I said that sushi was cheating because there's just so many options but for this one we're going to dive right into that and all you got to do is leave a comment down below with the hashtag sushi and let us know what your favorite type of sushi is. Even though it might be a little bit more bland, I'm a huge fan of sushimi. Something about just the fish on its own really lets you experience it, and it all tastes fantastic. But when I do go for sushi, if I can find real crab, which is almost impossible where I live, that's always a great choice. But other than that, I'll destroy anything that's spicy and has those crunchy bits. And I know that the panko is pretty much just filler, but it's also like pure carbs, so how can it not taste good?
And I should probably mention that this giveaway is for a deluxe edition of the game with all the Kickstarter exclusives and stretch goals. And there are some pretty crazy upgrades already included in this pledge. And the last giveaway we have for today is going to be for the Game Toppers campaign. And if you haven't checked this one out yet, it's offering a bunch of different play mats and Game Topper components, as well as the Game Toppers themselves. And if you're interested in what these mats look like, well, I actually have one on my table right now and I absolutely love it. Looks fantastic and it is a very high quality and I do recommend them. And like I said, there's a whole bunch of different accessories and items offered in this campaign, but this giveaway is going to be for one of their tote bags. And I actually really, really love these tote bags. I've used a whole bunch of different gaming bags throughout my gaming career, but these are definitely the ones I prefer because they fold up and store away really, really nicely, and they're very affordable, and they don't take up a ton of space, and they get the job done. So these are the ones that I do recommend. And if you are a gamer, these are really, really nice to have so that you're not carrying all your board games around in cardboard boxes. And to enter this giveaway, all you gotta do is leave a comment down below with the hashtag bag, and you can leave any comment that you like. Good luck in the giveaways, but now let's go ahead and draw the winners for last week's giveaways, and we had quite a few to draw for last week. We have Kelp, along with Demoniac, Chaos Cove, and a Game Topper tote bag. And to draw a winner, I use this fancy application here. All these extra names down here are bonus entries for my Patreon subscribers. If you do like this sort of content and the effort that goes into it, I do appreciate any support to help make these efforts just a little bit more sustainable for me. Plus it gets you some extra entries into these giveaways, which is never a bad thing. But we're gonna draw four kelp first here. So let's go ahead and draw those comments and draw a winner. And the winner for kelp is Marie and Eric from Patreon, and that's perfect because this is a two-player game, so congratulations to both of you. Feel free to email me at adam at shelfclare.com, but if I don't hear from you, I will reach out and let you know that you won yourself a pretty awesome pledge here. But let's go ahead and draw for Demoniac, so we're going to do the exact same thing here. Oops. Hashtag demon. And grab those comments. And draw a winner. And the winner is Amanda Sheridan. Congratulations on the win. I'll reach out and let you know that you won yourself a pledge for Demoniac. And next we'll draw for Chaos Cove. So let's go ahead and add some chaos. Grab those comments and draw a winner. And the winner for Chaos Cove is Red Beetle, also from Patreon, so congratulations. I'll reach out to you and let you know that you won yourself a pledge. And I always do feel a little bad when all our winners are from the Patreon, when all of you did leave so many awesome comments on the video. I do want to make some changes here that will improve the odds of winning if you do leave a comment, but it's also going to be a win-win for the Patreon subscribers as well, because the change I want to make is just to allow Patreon subscribers to opt into the giveaways that they want to be entered in, which will drastically decrease the amount of of free entries into each giveaway, but then also the Patreons will only be entering in the ones that they want. So I think this will make it a better experience for everyone. I just need a little time to figure out a system to do all this, but I'll try to look into this over the holidays and hopefully I can have something ready or near ready in the new year. But this last giveaway was for a tote bag, and this one was for Canada only. So for this one, I'm only going to draw from the YouTube comments because I also don't have a way to filter out patrons based on their location. And most of my patrons aren't in Canada, so I think this one is safe to just draw from the YouTube comments. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's draw the comments and draw a winner. And the winner of the tote bag is... Dylan, and he says he would use it constantly, and I'm glad to hear that because you are the lucky winner of the tote bag. Just email me at adam at and we'll get that all sorted out. And that's everything I have for you this week, and I did want to talk a little bit about what's going on with the Lucky Duck campaign with Food Chain Magnate and the very expensive pledges there. But unfortunately, I've run out of time here, and I do have some friends waiting for me, so I gotta run, but I will try to catch up on this in next week's episode. So until then, thanks so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And as always, keep that shelf cluttered and the table full.